Intel has descended from Mount Olympus, bringing new 8-core desktop mainstream CPUs. The pricing is kind of high, and the accessories pricing is kind of high, but what do you get for that? Well, you get the absolute pinnacle of performance. And, you know, performance per dollar, mm, that's a debate for another video. Check out our launch day, you know, Z390 motherboard, where we sort of talk turkey about the Z390 chipset and the new 9000 series CPUs. This. This is a motherboard review, and this is a motherboard review for the MSI MEG Z390 ACE. MSI's got three new motherboard divisions. MEG is sort of the upper echelon, if you will, the deluxe chariot in which you can carry your, you know, hand delivered from Zeus himself, eight core, 16 thread CPU from Intel. So that's the i9 anyway. You could also opt for the i7, which is an eight core, eight thread part. But with the Z390 chipset come new features, things like onboard USB 3.1 Gen 2, no more as media controllers, everything is built in to the Intel chipset. USB 3.1 Gen 2, more ports than ever. In fact, the ACE has two front panel connections for USB type C reversible uh, connections for whatever case will have that. Or you can also get an add in expansion card where like the cable would run to a port on the back and then you would have an extra USB type C port on the back. Also has ridiculous power delivery, the ACE does. Uh, power delivery for that eight core CPU because goodness gracious, it does consume the power and it does generate the heat to the extent that it was necessary to upgrade the thermal interface material back to solder. So before we get into the nitty gritty with our testing, let's run through the motherboard specs, like the motherboard manufacturer specs. Maybe I can sort of explain that. So it says, unique and infinity design combining 13 phases VRM optimized with the Core i9 for a rich specification featuring Mystic Light Infinity Triple Turbo M.2 with uh, Shield Frozer Audio Boost HD Game Boost and dual USB 3.1 Gen 2 connectors. Okay, so there's a lot in there. We're gonna unpack that statement, if you will. We're gonna unpack that feature list, I don't know really what you want to call it, but there's a lot there. There's a lot of stuff going on here. This motherboard actually is unique in its uh, PCI Express layout, at least the Z390. Uh, some motherboard vendors are opting for some unique configurations of your PCI Express lanes. So we're gonna talk more about that. First up, 13 phases VRM. Uh, you know, let's save the VRM conversation for a little bit later. So it does say triple turbo M.2 with shield frozer. So there is a neat feature with this in terms of like M.2 heat shields, it'll actually hold the M.2 in a sandwich. So you get a heat sink on the top and bottom. Now, strictly speaking, flash memory for riding to flash memory, the flash memory itself functions better if it's warm. But the controller, the microcontroller that controls the interface between the PCI Express and the memory, generally not good if it's overheating. So you do want a heat sink on your controller. You generally don't need a heat sink on flash memory, even with very high write cycles. That said, this does have three M.2 slots, one of which has a heat shield that you can optionally use or not use. But it's pretty cool. This is the first one that I've seen that actually has a heat sink on the bottom as well, so it sort of grabs a hold of your M.2 like a sandwich. So the Infinity Design. The Infinity Design is an aesthetic thing. This thing has a Corsair RGB header, 5050 RGB headers and you know the digital LED strips, but it also has a built-in addressable area with this Infinity Mirror reflection thing. So, you know, it's not, uh, <laughs> don't want any Marvel uh, IP guys coming after us or anything like that, but it is an infinite reflection of RGB goodness that, you know, even Mr. T, not that Mr. T, the purple Mr. T could get behind because if it's infinity awesomeness, I don't know. Cycle 1151, four sockets, DDR4, 4500 up to DDR4, 4500 OC. So yes, overclocking. Uh, is ridiculous on this platform. Because when you've got eight CPU cores, you're gonna need a lot of memory bandwidth to keep that thing fed. Now, of course, the out of the box spec for the new Intel eight core CPUs is 2666, but you will realize a, a performance benefit running upwards of, you know, 3200, 3400. Uh, you know, on Team Red, the, the performance improvement's a little more pronounced than Team Blue. So if you've got 2666, it's really not gonna hurt anything if you're running a 2666. But if it were me personally, 3200, 3400, 3600, sort of that sweet spot for, the, for price to performance ratio is what I would go for, especially if I were looking to build a, a high-end gaming system. And when we're talking about eight cores, there's really not a lot of games that will properly take advantage of eight cores. Now with six cores, you know, even for games that are optimized for four cores, it leaves two other cores for background processes and things that are running in Windows, but for a strictly gaming experience, 
I don't know about eight cores. I don't know what the, the value proposition there is. Now, if you're streaming or doing other stuff in the background while you're playing games, then yeah, yeah, I think that I think that the proposition, I think the benefit is there. But for most games that are not super heavily multi-threaded, eight cores does not yet make sense. I think if you're buying for eight cores, you're you're buying for the future, you're buying for virtualization, you're buying for maybe a Linux workstation. We'll definitely talk about the Linux particulars, but we gotta go through the rest of the spec sheet list. So it supports the ninth generation and eighth generation. That's something a lot of people don't understand. You can actually use an eighth generation. CPU on this, so like the Core i3, Core i5, you know, 8700K, you can totally use an 8700K on this motherboard. Likewise, you can use a ninth gen CPU on a Z370 motherboard, although you will need a UEFI update or a BIOS update before you can use the CPU, unless your motherboard has BIOS flashback or some type of BIOS flashing mechanism, or you can flash the BIOS from a USB stick with no CPU installed, which a lot of motherboards have, but not every motherboard has. This one has that feature. Uh, you would need to make sure that the motherboard that you're buying is updated for the ninth gen CPUs. Or you can buy Z390 and be sure that Z390 is gonna be compatible with both eighth and ninth generation CPUs out of the box. That said, there really hasn't been a lot of time that has passed from Z370 to Z390. So a lot of manufacturers are really interested in only building the highest end Z390 motherboards. And so you've got the Meg Z390 Ace. The only other board above this really is the Z390 Godlike. I mean, these are extremely high end boards and they command a price tag to, to boot. I mean, we've got dual eight pin power inputs. This says it's a 13 phase VRM. They're using some components that I don't recognize and I couldn't find the spec sheet for, but we can go ahead and talk about the, uh, the VRM situation right now. This is technically a, a, uh, an eight phase output rectifier, but if you look, you can see that our, our choke configuration here, we have 12 chokes. And so you would expect to find some phase doublers. And in fact, we do. There are six IR3598 phase doublers. So this is really kind of a 12 plus one configuration, I think. And you can see that one of the chokes is a higher end choke that's uh, sort of at the bottom of the stack of chokes uh, at the uh, IO shield side of the motherboard. So in terms of like, does it deliver uh, to Z39, does it deliver to the 9000 series CPU in a way that you would expect? So a 4.3 gigahertz overclock on a 9900K, the motherboard didn't really even, I mean, it got, it got warm, but not hot, and definitely not alarmingly so. And a 5.3 gigahertz overclock is um, probably about the top end of what you would expect on air or with, uh, on a good air cooler or a reasonable all-in-one cooler. Pushing past that, thermals and stability, I don't know, it can be a little little tricky, but in terms of power delivery on this motherboard for that level of overclock, I don't think you're gonna really have much of an issue. So for me, my general criteria around power delivery is overclock it as much as a normal person would or even a, an enthusiast person would. 5.3 gigahertz is a pretty significant overclock, especially when we're talking about eight cores versus six cores in the previous generation. So 5.3 gigahertz on all cores. Does the motherboard overheat? Does the, the socket get excessively hot? is a reasonable cooling solution sufficient to keep that CPU cool. And 5.3 gigahertz I think is okay, but at 5.4 gigahertz, the power utilization really increases dramatically, at least on the one CPU that I had. So uh, 5.3 to 5.4 gigahertz, even though it's soldered, uh, I'm, not, I'm not really sure that you're gonna be in a position to overclock that far. And even if you are, I don't think power delivery is gonna be the issue. And so that's really the evaluation criteria. Does it overheat? Does the motherboard shut down? Do you have to fiddle with it? Is there anything really to worry about as far as that goes? And again, sort of informal anecdotal testing, not really an issue on this motherboard. Next up on the feature list, pre-installed IO shield. Yes, the, the IO shield is pre-installed. I'm finding that I like pre-installed IO shields more and more, and they've done a pretty good job here. There's, there's a couple of screws, three screws, four screws, something like that, holding the IO shield in. You don't have to worry about the IO shield. You just mount the motherboard and it's good to go. I like that feature. It's a nice, nice quality of life improvement. You've got the clear CMOS button and the BIOS flashback. I've already explained what BIOS flashback was. It's got an onboard gigabit ethernet NIC. This is the killer NIC. 2500. It's the killer E2500 gigabit LAN. I'm, I'll confess and say that I would have liked to have seen a, you know, like a 2.5 gig or a 5 gig Aquantia NIC instead of killer. That said, a lot of people that are super into gaming actually like the killer brand and the killer um, network prioritization software is a big bundled item for this. So if you run Windows and you want the network prioritization software, 
you can totally do that with the killer NIC. Now, I know there's a lot of people in our audience that really like Intel NICs. I myself am partial to Intel NICs. I mean, you basically get a free Intel NIC with the, the onboard on CPU situations. You just have to pay Intel for it. So I think I would have, on the motherboard this high end, I think I would have liked to have seen the Intel NIC plus the killer NIC, but I think you could probably move up a model and, uh, and get that need satisfied. We've also got USB 3.1 Gen 2, both Type A and Type C at the rear I.O. We've got golden audio jacks with SPDIF. Now, MSI is Mystic Light for their RGB lighting solution. The Mystic Light software has actually a lot of functionality in terms of being able to hook into applications and control desk lighting and control external RGB strips, digital LED, uh, LED strips, your CPU cooler. It's got the Corsair header. So Corsair has this whole family of RGB stuff. It's pretty nuts. You can check out, I mean, you know, sort of free plug for, for Corsair. Check out their website in the, the, the Corsair digital header. There's some more information about that in the manual on the Z390 Ace, but there's a lot of stuff around RGB. There are a lot of people that are super into RGB and it definitely moves motherboards from a marketing standpoint. I myself, not super into RGB, but uh, you know, Infinity Mirror, digitally addressable. Maybe I could turn it into some kind of a display, like make the LEDs go nuts if my computer's overheating or my load average is above 12 or something like that, I don't know. Okay, let's talk for a second about the PCI Express layout and the peripherals. This motherboard has three physical by 16 slots. That'll, that are, those are by 16 lanes directly to the CPU. So Z390 and the new 9000 series CPUs don't really change much with how the CPU interfaces to the rest of the system. There are 16 lanes plus the DMI. The DMI 3.0 interface is basically the equivalent of a PCI Express 3.0 by 4 interface. So that PCI Express 3.0 by 4 interface is up to about four gigabytes per second. And that's what the Z390 chipset is actually hooked up to. The Z390 chipset is hooked up to the Intel CPU through that DMI 3.0 interface. So that link is at most four gigabytes per second. Now our three M.2 slots go through the Z390 chipset, which means that if you're running a, a, a two drive M.2 RAID with higher performance M.2s like a Samsung 960s, it will bottleneck because those Samsung 960 drives can manage about 3.5 gigabytes per second, which only leaves about 500 megabytes to play with in terms of bandwidth. Now, in terms of your by 16 slots, however, this motherboard does something unusual. The most, almost all Z370 motherboards, the bottom slot is also a, a by four connection to the chipset. Intel recommends that, you know, they say up to 24 lanes or up to 28 lanes through the through the chipset, but all of those lanes go through the DMI. And it can be good for, for things like USB peripherals and peripherals where you're not using multiple things at the same time, but it's not really very good if you're running M.2 RAID. So what MSI has done is if you're gonna run SLI, you can the, the, the first two slots will run it by eight by eight, and then the bottom slot is, is turned off because it'll actually share bandwidth. So to be clear, you could run a single graphics card at a by eight interface, and then two other high speed PCI Express 3.0 peripherals at by four. So you could have a three drive M.2 RAID if you wanted to, eight lanes being through the CPU lanes and four lanes being through the DMI lanes, or you could have a PCI Express by four capture card plus a two drive M.2 RAID and not bottleneck as long as you're using an add-in card that will adapt M.2 to your PCI Express slot, which is pretty cool. I mean, it's good to see that. It's good to see that manufacturers are waking up and saying, you know, there's not really enough PCI Express bandwidth for peripherals, especially if we've got these M.2 lanes going through the chipset. Now, if you just happen to have two M.2s, like you've got one 960 for your operating system drive and you got another 960, for your Steam library or something like that, that's not really gonna bottleneck because you're really only gonna be using one drive at a time. It's just the, the RAID 0, RAID 1 for reads type situations where you would bottleneck in terms of being able to uh, use both the full bandwidth of, of both drives. And I think manufacturers are recommending uh, are recognizing that. It would be nice to see Intel come out with a, a version of 1151, a slightly updated socket that would give you a PCI Express by eight interface to the chipset. I really think that that's overdue for enthusiasts like us. I mean, for mainstream people, one M.2, they're never gonna run anything more than, than one M.2. It makes sense, it's cheap, it's easy to deal with, fine. But for people that are, that are gonna shell out for the eight core 16 thread 9900K and a very nice, very high end motherboard, I think that it makes more sense for the DMI interface to be a PCI Express by eight connection minimally.
And that would put this platform at parity with uh, competitors like AMD, because with AMD, you have 16 plus four plus four. So the AMD platform actually does have an extra four PCI Express 3.0 uh, connection dedicated for the M.2. And the other PCI Express by four connection to the AMD chipset is very similar to the DMI interface. It's just that the M.2 doesn't run through the chipset. Secondary M.2 slots can run through the chipset, which ironically will not bottleneck as hard as this, even though they are running at a, a slower PCI Express 2.0 speed, again, on the AMD platform. But for raw performance, eight cores, 16 threads, you can't beat it. And it is insanely fast, but it commands a substantial price premium. So be sure to check out our, our video, our analysis of the 9000 series CPU launch if you're contemplating building a system uh, based on this and you sort of want our input, but this has been a sort of a quick review of the motherboard and the overall features. Now in terms of Linux compatibility, this motherboard is great uh, in terms of Linux compatibility right out of the box. The audio codec, the Realtek ALC 1220 codec with its supported accoutrement, everything is basically picked up and operational by Linux. I did not try the front panel USB type C ports, but the Z390 patches, that USB controller was actually a part of like the H370 chipset. So in terms of kernel patches for that, th those have been there for a while. So as long as you've got a relatively up-to-date Linux distro, you should be okay on those USB type C ports. Generally, it should, should be fine for you. Now in terms of IO MMU groups and things like that, this platform is actually very, very solid in terms of IO MMU group breakdown. And I was delighted to see that our by eight by four by four configuration on our PCI Express lanes to the CPU are actually separated into multiple different IO MMU groups. So if you wanted to run a three graphics card crossfire type situation where it's by eight by four by four for each graphics card, each one of those graphics cards is gonna be in its own IO MMU group. Plus we've got the PCI Express by one expansion slots on this motherboard, which mean that those are also gonna be in their own IO MMU groups. In addition, the onboard controllers are, are all separated. The killer NIC is pretty well supported on Linux. So in terms of Linux support for this motherboard, basically plug and play, basically out of the box, you're fine. Because the motherboard also has the Game Boost knob, which is, you know, MSI's turn it up to 11. It's a sort of a table of preset overclocks that are likely to work with your CPU. You can dial it in and get a little bit better in terms of less heat production or more stability with less voltage, that kind of thing. I do recommend you, you learn and dial it in, but if you just want to set it and forget it, the Game Boost knob actually does work pretty well because MSI has loaded in a lot of information about that. If you have any other support experiences or just stories you want to share with this, come hang out with us on the Level 1 Text Forums. I'm Wendell, I'm signing out. I'll see you there.